Okay, welcome back. Second talk. Um, this is Domin Kuzar. He's since uh, about 2009 into packaging. I think in the Google Summer of Code project, get introduced working in the Gentoo tooling. Since about eight years in the Python community, since about two years contributing to Nix, and he's uh, talking today about the state of Python packaging and how that reflects in Nix. <clears throat> hey everyone. I hope you have stretched and got coffee near awake. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how terrible packaging is in Python and how we're slowly fixing that um, in, in Nix and in Python community. Um, I assume you know a little bit of Nix. I assume you know almost nothing about Python. Um, oh, and if you have any questions during the talk, please ask. Um, it's easier than at the end. So just raise your hand. I'll, I'll repeat the question. So, um, so for just a bit of outline, we go through history, how setup.py works, what are the caveats in packaging, how built Python package works, then what the caveats in Nix, and you know what's next from you know from my perspective. Um, so, so a bit about history. Um, there was these utils, um, and still is. Um, and this is how the packaging looks like in these tutorials. You have this setup function that does everything you can think of. Um, and you tell it submit the data and what are the modules. Um, and then you can uh, install that uh, in Python and it will um, store it in, in a special path. More about that later. You can build C extensions. Uh, you can create a tarball. So it does everything, of course. Um, so, so this details was very, very basic. It was mainly meant for building and installing stuff, but it doesn't know about you know um, downloadings, um, dependencies, and it doesn't know about dependencies at all. Um, there is no way to reproduce an installation. You're just like imperative um, commands, and you know hope you you hope everything works. And it was included in into Python in 2000, um, so a long time ago. Um, and then setup tools came four years later, um, and it's using the same interface. In fact, it monkey patches these utils in order to to provide that support. So, um, and you know, you, you have this easy install command that will fetch from the uh, Python packaging index. That's the central repository for packages. Uh, you have this binary format, which is a zip file, and you you know you compile all the C extensions, and it zips them up. Um, and you know you you and you can also use all the these tutorials commands, but it's mon monkey patches this tutorial, so it's even you know the situation is even worse. It doesn't support uninstall. It's the worst code I've read. At least in 2009, I haven't touched it since because I don't want to. Um, and and in 2009, there was no release for for years. Um, so that was that was pretty depressing area in packaging. <laughs> And, and still, we, we do everything from setup.py, and, and it handles you know the state of the world. Um, so you know, just just to show you how bad this is and, and was, um, is install actually for each dependencies, it would fetch the description, and then for every link that was in the description, it would go to that page and find the possible turbo release. So not not only going to the packaging index, it would try to crawl the internet for more releases. Uh, which is like what you know the install times were really terrible and and you know you later see that this is, was fixed in, only in 2014 and there was you know a lot of politics around whether you know this kind of backwards compatibility should be kept or not so this is why everything is going slow because you know once you give something to the people they want, don't want it you they don't want it that you take that from them um, so then in 2007, I Baking, which is not working for Mozilla, um, he wrote a virtual end, which is kind of like Nick shell for Python. It sim links Python into a, a, you know, a folder test in this case, and then you can install the Python package in an isolated way. Um, and he wrote pip, which is kind of a fork of easy install. Um, which was a really nice move because you want the installer software to be separated from the build uh, in in languages and and you know it has a nice interface it it has like phases um, it can freeze versions of independencies and so on 
Um, and then Tariq Ziad in 2008, which also now works for Mozilla, um, basically said, okay, we have to fix this. And, you know, again, after lots of politics, he forked, set up tools and wrote distribute, um, tried to document stuff and, and improve that code base. But he, and then the same year, figured out the only way is to rewrite. Um, and, and finally, I think this is, at least as far as I know, the first um, actual implementation of static metadata in, in Python using setup.cfg file. Um, so it, the, you would have a static file that you know can be parsed and stored and so on instead of evaluating setup I every time. Um, but in 2012, he pretty much stepped down. Um, that you know, the, the, there is a long story around that, and it's not really that important. But the, the, the end result is that Distutors was pretty much left alone, and Distribute at least got merged back into Setup Tools. Um, so people are very confused. We had like Setup Tools, Distributes, the Distutors two, and then that merges back and forth. So a lot of effort, and and you know, some results, but still not not that not that good. Um, and then, then that was the area where people actually started to talk and they said, okay, now we have to start with specification first and, and discuss things before we go and implement that. So um, in 2012, that's, where, that's when it happened. And then after 2012, a lot of PEPs came and PEPs are Python enhancement proposals. They're pretty much how to improve Python. Um, so there's like a lot of stuff that came after that. And, you know, we're really thankful to all the, the people that are working on that. Um, and now it's a community effort. Um, but you see there the metadata 2.0, that's the static metadata format is still a draft. And all the PEPs that follows are pretty much like specific parts of that metadata. So it's going kind of slow, but that's how we want it to be. We don't, you know, we've, we've tried to rush it and it failed. So that's the only way. Um, so yeah, set up high. Um, this is, you know, a typical, uh, a call of that function. Um, you, you know, there's not much, much here to, I'll talk about specific parts later, but, um, you know, you have like entry points at the bottom where you specified what, what executables to generate, you have different kind of dependencies, some metadata, and that's pretty much it. Um, so then Python actually, how, how it finds the packages is using the Python path. Um, and this is uh, an example of the PBR package. Um, you see it all depends on setup tools and on Python, of course. And then if you actually run the Python and import syspath, that's like what Python interprets from that uh, Python path. And you'll see it adds a bunch of Python related uh, paths. Um, and at the top, you see it's an empty string. So um, that's the current directory. And it's so when you import a package, it goes from the top, from the bottom, and tries to find a, a module or a folder, a file or a folder, and run that. Um, so it's, it's, that's very simple. Um, but, you know, so there are a lot of things that are bad. I'll just talk of some of those. We could have a few hour talk um, just on this topic. But, you know, um, so we have three different basically graphs of so dependencies. Setup requires build time, runtime, and optional. And you see there's like even the for starters, even the names, sometimes they have S at the, at the end and sometimes not. So yeah, I always miss that. Um, and, and you know, another thing is the extras include the testing, but there is no like convention what the testing set should be called. And some people call it test, some people call it testing and so on. These are all the things that make it really hard to, to parse this. Uh, and we have three se separate uh, directed cyclic graphs. So I'll talk about why that's hard in Nix a bit later. Um, so we have in Python supports, um, circular dependencies, of course, um, and and that's pretty much because because pip the installer that everyone uses it runs in phases, so it will first download everything, and then it will run on all the packages the build command, and then on all the packages install command, and then it doesn't run tests at all. Um, so all phases are are for the whole package set. 
Um, and that's why it can do these kind of things. But you know, in, in, in Nix, this is problematic because we install packages as a one unit and build them as a one unit. Um, and, and, and there are not easy ways to go around circle dependencies. Um, that one is, you know, to bootstrap. Um, something like we do for for you know the standard environment and something we will we have to do for for pip and similar and the other way is is to do this kind of nix stuff like you know b depends on a but you know in this case it doesn't depend then back on b and so on um so so if if there is one thing I want you to remember from this talk, it's this: in Python, tests are the single source of truth. If you don't have, if you don't run tests, you don't know what you packaged. You know, you packaged a bunch of things you never really ran, and, and you know, because everything is at runtime. In our, even our packaging, um, the, the tests are the only way to really test something happen. Um, so you know, when you package Python stuff, always. Um, the most of the effort goes into making sure that these tests actually execute. And um, if a single test fails, we don't we don't want to disable the whole test suite. We want to disable that test and, and leave others be there. And, um, so, but a, a lot of times the source this doesn't come with tests. Uh, a lot of times people use mocking in Python. So if you upgrade a dependency, there is no guarantee that it will you know, work even though we have tests. And you know, people try to do everything in tests. And, and you know, it's a lot, a lot of effort, as I said, goes into fixing those things. Um, you know, you, people have even do things like you know, run this command and it succeed in 200 milliseconds. But when you run these things on Hydra, you know, the, because of the I/O, that's that's not a guarantee. So a lot of time we have to decide, the, disable those tests. Um, also, like Python versioning, Python we have currently supported our 2.7, 3.3, 3.4, um, 3.5, and I think 3.3. 3, yeah, that's that's it. So you know, a lot of versions to support, and then you know, um, Nix has to support all of them. Then, and and the way that in in packaging metadata, we how we declare this, um, what's supported is the cl with classifiers. Um, but the problem is, oh well, no one uses that, or it's it's you know it's outdated. So nobody is using that information to automate. Um, you know the the metadata to say okay the, I'm gonna support um, the R build based on these classifiers. Um, so there is no this feedback loop. At least I've I haven't seen it. So the only way to support that is really to to look up the documentation and and really specify manually what the ver the Python versions are supported. So that's it's not too much work, but we have to do it for every package. Um, all right. So the next thing is the manifest file, which is kind of important in packaging, uh, and it basically specifies what files to include besides the Python files. So if you have like icons or or anything basically that your your program uses, and you know usually you would say okay, you would just create a package and say graft my package, and everything under that will be included into the tarball, but um, you know, people don't want to maintain that f file because a lot of time they will forget to add something. They will deploy, and you know there will be an icon missing. So they made like that this package that a lot of people use set up those Git. So like it will use Git to list all the files in the Git to know what what are the things that belong to this project. But that means we depend on .git folder. Um, at in build and install time, and you know we know that in Nix it's it's we have problems because it's not that deterministic, so that's sometimes a bit of a pain, um, but it's something to be careful about. Uh, and you know, just just so you give you get an idea what can be in setup high, um, you know people do a lot of stuff, a lot of times things like this, so they will check the current interpreter for what version it is and include arc parse. And this is because ArcPass was added in Python 2.7, so um, they will declare on dependency on ArcPass for for Python 2.6. And and this is a problematic because if you run setup pi with different versions of Python, you will get a different metadata. <laughs> so um, that that makes things even more complicated. Or they will even do things like this, you know, like try to import it and then depend on it. 
Um, and, and PEP 496, which is from this year, actually adds these environment markers. So for every dependency, you can like add a bit of like what under what environment this should be true. Um, so, you know, we're progressing. <laughs> it's not that bad. And, and just to give you an idea how bad this, this can be, Pillow is uh, a Python imaging um, library and, you know, it's like almost thousand lines and, you know, it tries to run brew and it tries to find the prefix from brew. And if it's there, it will add some paths where it should find stuff and so on. And this is for different Linux distributions. They have hard-coded stuff where it finds. So it's, it's you know, anything can be in setup high. Um, and, and, you know, uh, re really, I don't see much contributions to this and it's it's something we should improve and something we should talk about. Um, but that's the current state. All right, so <coughs> enough about that. So now we remove into how how Nick supports Python and what can be done to improve that. Um, and I'm I'm gonna go through all the build Python package source codes really quickly because it's very small. Um, just so that you know maybe it will scare you away, but maybe that will give you a bit of an insight um, what's going on, and and hopefully we'll get more contributors. So I skipped the the first lambda function of dependencies because I'll explain all the dependent you know all the arguments um, throughout the, the source. So first we we throw this error if if the disabled flag is specified and and that's per you know if if a specific version of Python is not supported and that's you know it's a little bit abusing Nicks but I think it's nice because. It gives you, you know, the name of the package and under what version is not supported, so it's user friendly. Um, all right, and then we define the the Python function, make derivation. We remove the disabled flag because we don't need it anymore. We inherit the do check, and do check is always true in Python, so we always run the test. As I said, that's the most important thing. Uh, we have the name prefix, so it will uh, prepend Python and the version before every package. Uh, we add a bunch of um, we add a bunch of helpers. We have this line that automatically adds zip uh, as a dependency, <laughs> um, unzip. Sorry if, if the the source is zip, and and then we add the propagated build inputs um, with um, setup tools uh, always included. Um, all right, and then the configure phase. This is the uh, we we export the deterministic build. This makes sure that the Python compiled files don't include timestamps. Um, you can well, it's there, so you can disable it. But I guess nobody will ever do that. Um, and this is, and then you know, the, here comes the the fun part. We we basically have to import setup tools before these two tools because setup tools patches these two tools, so it has to be imported first. Um, so yeah, that's how we do it. There is there are better ways to do it by by um, first importing setup tools and then evaluating setup i. But yeah, that's how we currently do it, and it kind of works. Um, and pip does the, the same thing, by the way. If you look at the source. Um, okay, then the check phase is just setup i tests. Um, the field phase runs setup i build with a bunch of flags um, and all the hooks. Um, all right, and then the install function, that's kind of the meat of it. Um, and, you know, it, it creates the, the site packages, that's where the Python packages are installed. Uh, it exports the Python path and then calls setup py install with a bunch of flags. Um, and then it will move a bit of files and, and remove them because if you have easy install dot path in every package, it will conflict when you install two packages into the same environment. So we move it and rename it. Um, and, and there is one flag that you see there, old and unmanageable, and I'll talk about it a bit later, and that's something we we have to get rid of. Um, and yeah. All right, then is the fix-up phase. This is where we wrap all the Python. Um, so all the executables in bin are wrapped with the propagated build inputs, basically, um, because they expect those Python packages to be available, um, and then we use this um, dot .pth files, and I'll talk about those a bit later. That's what the next, uh, that's what this snippet does, and then we have this shell hook, um, which 
if there is a setup.py file, it will run setup.py develop, so we, it will actually like um, enable you to to it enables you to develop Python software, and you will have that you know installed and importable. Um, it's it's not that nice, but it works really well. Um, oh, so I forgot to explain about the PTH files. So um, this is this is a kind of um, hack in Python because uh, if you just say if you point Python path to just one package like you know uh, Django, it will it will use these PTH files to discover all the other packages so that it will recursively import all the other packages so you don't have to always specify the whole dependency tree. Um, and and so that makes Python path kind of auto discoverable. Um, I'm not. I'm, I, I haven't. I didn't write this, but I don't know if it's a good idea. But that's what we currently have. <laughs> um, so okay, we have next. We don't support namespaces because of that old and unmanageable flag. Um, and you know we will see stuff like you know this the that the the init files collide. And and you know what's what's really going on is that setup setup tools has this. Um, if in this any file you can say declare namespace, so that that in that that way it knows that the logilab package can come from the logilab folder can come from different packages, uh, which is a terrible idea in my in my opinion. But it, it's a feature that people use. It's not encouraged anymore, but still there are packages out there. Um, and so the way to currently fix that is just to ignore collisions and these files will just, you know, merge and, and it should work more or less. Um, but, but we are going to support that with wheels and I'm going to talk about it a little bit later. Um, okay, that's another thing that, you know, not only Python has a problem with, but um, if, if you have two different versions in, in, the, in the graph, um, the first one in the Python file will be used, and it, we won't conflict. And again, that's because of the old and unmanageable flag. Uh, and again, this will be improved with the wheel support, uh, so that we at install time, you know, this will will be detected. Um, and then the imperative package management. If you do things like okay, install NumPy and Python, import, you know, you will get. It's not available, and that's because we we in profiles we don't populate the Python path. Um, you you have to specify it yourself, um, and and you know this is up for discussion um, if this is a good idea or not. Um, I think I think if you, if we put, if we pollute the Python path in profiles, it's a bit problematic because it's you know Python. If you if you'll do anything, it will also find those packages. So if you're not using a change root or something to build stuff, it's gonna you're gonna have you're gonna leak stuff, uh, and Python won't build or detect that it needs something and so on. Um, but you know I I am. I have an opinion about this, but I'm easy. You know, somebody wants to convince me. I'm, I'm up for discussion. Um, okay, so a bit, a bit. So now a little bit about what problems rise up when you package stuff. Um, and you know, one of the things is that Python three doesn't have a Python binary, so a lot of packages assume there is a Python binary. So currently, we just uh, replace the Python with Python interpreter, which is the full path to the binary and that sometimes needed. Um, then we have stuff like um, the the tests will depend actually on the installed files, and and because check phase comes before the install phase in Nix, uh, this is a bit problematic. But you can say okay, check skip the check phase, do install check phase, which comes after, and and you can kind of export the path and run the tests, and that kind of happens a lot of times. Um, then we have another thing that sometimes interpreters already ship with a library. So, for example, enum 3.4 comes in Python 3.4, so you want to to the, to only include it before that. And it's problematic because you will get very weird errors if you don't do that because people don't assume you would install it um, on 3.4, for example, and you'll see it's just not supported there. Uh, so th those are the things that are really hard because you get a very weird error message if you don't do it. 
Um, and something similar is for PyPy, which is an uh, alternative implementation of Python uh, in Python itself. Um, it, ha it ships with this uh, CFFI library, so you, if, you, if you add that dependency, uh, it will pick it, PyPy will pick it up, and because it's not inter it won't use the internal one, it will, you will get conflicts because the released version might be different from the one that ships with PyPy, and you'll get, again, very weird stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you could, in, yeah, so the question is, can we do this more automatic? And, and yes, um, of course, in, in the build Python package, we could, you know, say if the PyPy, uh, if we have the PyPy interpreter, then skip these things. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, the, the, this is well, well, it's kind of questionable whether to use this. Well, in built inputs, it will work this technique, but not if you, for example, use it in string substitutions. Yes, so, exactly. So, yeah, well, I always don't know whether to use this technique like for uh, this uh, Darwin stuff. Yes. You know, icon and such. But yeah, yeah, that's, it's, that's it's one of the discussion. That's one of the problems. If you use null, then if you have, yeah, if you use that package in a string, you will get uh, a confusing error message. Um, and, and that's why I prefer not to do that. But we could filter it out or something. It's, it's definitely something that can be improved um, in, in the Python packaging. Um, so, um, so there is another thing that Python, when it reads files from the file system, it will do that based on locale. So a lot of times you will get a, like a Unicode error in tests. And, and then you have to do something like this um, to depend on locales and export that. And, and you know, it's, yeah. Um, um, and, and a lot of times people will like hard code, um, you know, exact version. And then most of the time the solution is to unhard code it, but not always. Um, and it kind of depends on what they're trying to do, of course. Uh, all right, and Python ships with with some built-in modules that are we 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 package them separately because, for example, TK inter depends on X, so you don't want the whole X uh, dependency tree. So there's a package separately. So then you you just use Python modules dot curses to to and and tricky part is that Python tr we built Python three as a whole and Python two is modularized. So um, that's something to improve there also. Um, and and you have to be careful which version you use. And and in Python three actually the all the modules are defined as null. So. All right, so, you know, lots of stuff to improve. Um, I haven't had too much time, but at least slowly we're getting somewhere also in the next. Uh, so this is something I'm going to work on a sprint, and if somebody's interested um, to help out. I think that to get a prototype, it shouldn't take more than a few a few days, probably a day or two. Um, it's going to be a bit more work to, to fix all the packages that break. Um, so, so what are wheels? Wheels is... Um, basically the next generation egg, and it's a well-defined standard in Python documented how, how the, when we build a package and we put it into a zip file, how, you know, where everything is and where it's the metadata and where, where the stuff that should be installed and scripts and so on. Um, so in other words, the, this is what will effectively change. Um, but why we want to do this is because this the path on packaging is this is where the most improvements happen. So we want to use the the latest upstream um, where where we we get all the the candies, um, and this will fix uh, as I said like a lot of bugs. Um, and then you know at someday we probably want to generate packages, but because there is no static metadata, that's really hard. So this is one part. Uh, where where 
we could research how much that metadata we can extract in 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 a like a central repository or something so it's easier to then from that static metadata to generate all the packages um but you know as I, as you saw before it's it's really hard to do that and it's going to be need a lot of work and mostly we'll have to work with upstream so that's kind of a lot of effort to do uh, contrary to to Haskell or something where they only have the static files and they can just use those uh, and you know we I, I think the Haskell and API in terms of Nix is really nice now. Um, um, it's not perfect, but it's way better than Python. So um, I think we should we should move also there with with Python. And and I think in general all the languages that we have, we we, sh we should try to have kind of similar APIs. So not everyone is doing their own thing. So and I think Haskell is currently the most you know advanced and and simple at the same time. So that's something to to do. Um, so yeah, that's that's a quick overview. Uh, at the bottom, there are two links. One is the first one is the the guide about Python packaging in general. It's it's very well written and it has the latest you know um, recommended uh, tools and and you know um, ways to package. And the second one is a bit of a reference manual I wrote for Python, and it and it's not perfect. And and you know I'm. Feel free to to tell me what's missing, and I'll I'll do my best. Um, and and the first line is just from the Python. Uh, that's actually one of the guidelines. So I don't know what it means, but uh, um, yeah, thanks. Questions. Okay, uh, so one thing that's not completely clear to me. Uh, so you mentioned uh, a new wheel format, and you also mentioned that static uh, descriptions would be good. So the new wheel format, does that still use uh, setup.py, or does that have a static description? So, well, kind of both. Um, it still uses setup.py, but it will generate the static metadata and put it into the wheel. Um, so only once you've built it, you will have that. So that's a bit too late for us to use. Uh, that's that's meant more like for for people doing um, stuff on you know build packages and trying to figure out um, stuff later on. Um, but the static metadata is something that's still in draft mode and it's currently not used anywhere. Uh, OpenStack people have their own. PBR package which does that and, and you know the the effort is very fragmented but we cannot use that so we'll we'll you know again have to do it our way somehow to, to so find it, it it wouldn't really be possible to take a wheel file and generate a Nix expression out of that. Yeah that's that's what actually um Florian uh, freezed off the uh, last year uh, and that's yeah, that's one way to do it. But the problem is, as I said before, if you run setup.py with different Python versions, you get different dependency graphs. So it's it's not that simple. <laughs> you know, uh, that's just one one problem that that's there. So we still have to run this script to generate the metadata, and it's dynamic and it's based on environment and so on. Um, so yeah, you might not get everything you need from that. It's Next question from Rock. Um, uh, there is one problem also which you forgot to mention is, and especially if you package any command line tool, uh, because of this recursive thing and the Python path is actually uh, is actually created at runtime. So if you have a command line utility, it will actually run a lot slower because it will need to figure it out the whole Python path. And it's quite performance boost like, uh, uh, hit when you do this. Yeah. So the only way, because it's basically at the build time, you know the Python path. What are my old dependencies? Why just not use it? You know, like just set it because it's you know about it. So it's like this recursive thing. No, it's that's not how Python works. That should be removed. Yeah, I agree. The the PTH hack is is you know Nix specific and it's a hack and and yeah it has drawbacks and I I. If you would ask me, I would remove it, but you know that's something we should talk about also. We have more questions. 
No, it's all clear. That's good. <laughs> Uh, so you said that um, quite often these Python packages, uh, so metadata like uh, their compatibility with specific Python versions is incorrect or incomplete, right? Yeah. Uh, so does Python do any continuous builds? I mean, uh, what's their CPAN called? Is that PyPy or? Py, py, yeah, py, yeah. Py. yeah. No, there is no. They actually don't run that because it's a script, so that they specifically don't run setup high. So the, the the index doesn't even know about dependencies um, um, because they don't want to run you know arbitrary code on, on there. So uh. it's it's pretty much just like description there, and that's pretty much it. And and you know it's problematic because if you like the way you generate the whole dependency in tree is Python is like if you depend on Django, you say okay, then you fetch Django, you run the setup high, then you know the first li you know uh, list of dependencies, and then you have to download all these packages and run setup pi to get more and and so it's you know you discover the dependency tree based on how you run these setup pi files so it's it's that's why it's you know that's why that's why we want to go to the static metadata but it's a lot of effort and a lot of people don't want that because you know it will break stuff of course and so on so it's yeah so, so I guess we should sort of infiltrate uh, PyPy to sort of provide uh, kind of Hydra as a continuous build service for uh, PyPy, and yeah, then, you then know. When, once, once uh, Python developers depend on that, they will automatically fix their bugs, and we we don't have to do it. Yeah. I was actually talking to to with Nick from Red Hat, and they're kind of interested maybe in sponsoring that work. But we, I've I've been too busy so far. But maybe yeah, that's something we could do, and and you know, fix a lot of like Python packaging stuff. But the problem is that you know there's the question when how where where this static metadata you know it's it's good that this goes upstream, and and you know where would you know, if we could solve a lot of problems in our ends, but that wouldn't go upstream, and that's kind of problematic because upstream in Python, we, it's not as bad as like in in JavaScript where releases happen a lot of times, but it's still pretty fast, and you you don't want to maintain that in in Nix, um, you know, ecosystem. So it has to be a community effort. So there is a lot of work to be done in this area, actually, to to come to sanity. <laughs> Yeah, one. One more thing. Ah. Yeah. So yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, it still sounds like the Python uh, situation in general is still a little bit of a mess, despite all the uh, improvements from the last couple of years. And uh, I was wondering seeing that in the Haskell community this has driven a lot of people towards Nix coming from Haskell because of uh, the packaging situ situation in their ecosystem. Do you see any movement of Pythonistas um, towards Nix uh, for similar reasons? Yeah, so in, in Python, you know, uh, unfortunately, well, for us, um, there is like a Conda package manager built in Python, which is pretty much a clone of Nix written in Python. And and I've talked to 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 the original developer in when I was at the Python conference, you know, like why why split this effort? And they basically said that we're we want to support Windows with Cygwin, which is a bad idea. And even Guido say that officially the author of Python. So what Conda does differently is they have separate specification for Windows and, and Unix. Um so they you know they they maintain both at the same time, so Windows has like native support. Um, and of course, the same could be done in Nix if Nix, you know, was ported to Windows natively. Um, but unfortunately, you know, they they're doing it their way, and, and they even got a big investment right now. So uh, you know, it's it's gonna. I think at the end we we have a better ecosystem, but it's gonna take more time to to show up basically, and and to convince people. Okay, any further questions? We would still have five minutes. Otherwise, I think we could start the break and to see each other again at, I think it must be 11.15.
Yes, I guess the right number. So thanks a lot. See you soon.